All right. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today, Leslie Malma, one of our master gardeners, will be presenting native plants for butterfly gardens. I thought this would be a great topic for June as we're starting to see uh, butterflies coming through. So Leslie will walk us through some of the components of putting together a butterfly garden. Thank you, Jan. So one of the fun things to note is that next week starts pollinator week. So what a good time to have a presentation on uh, butterflies. Um, they are secondary pollinators. We know that our native bees are the primary pollinators, but um, butterflies, they um, have those nice fuzzy hairs. So they're going to do that secondary pollination for us, which is awesome. Um, so today, before we start off, we're gonna talk briefly about the life history of butterflies. After all, if we're going to create a garden that supports butterflies, then we need to know a little bit about their life cycle. Let's see if I can get my PowerPoint to advance. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> the buttons don't want to work on the computer to advance it, so I'll have to do it with the mouse. Um, so butterflies and moths make up the Lepidopteran order of insects. Uh, this is the second largest order of insects, second only to the Coleoptera, which are the beetles. Um, there are more moth species than butterflies. Uh, globally, there are over 100,000 described species of Lepidoptera, which are organized into about 135 families. In North America, we're looking at over 11,000 Lepidoptera species that comprise 75 families. But as you can see here on the screen, there are only six families of butterflies. So I'm gonna briefly describe them for you. There's the Papiliana dei, and these are the swallowtails. And we always associate swallowtails with that little tail extension at the end of the hind uh, wing, but not all swallowtails will have this extension, but they are a large, uh, a large butterfly and they have three pairs of walking legs. Uh, the next family is the Pyridae, and these are the whites and the yellows. Now they too have three pairs of walking legs and adults are predominantly white or yellowish and they will have some black markings uh, and they may also have some hidden ultraviolet patterns that are useful in courtship. The next family is the Lysinadiae and these are the gossamer wing butterflies. You also will know them as blues, coppers, and the hair streaks. So they have three pairs of walking legs as well. And these are a relatively small butterfly. And they have a fluted hind wing, which makes them quite lovely. Now, some species are extinct, which uh, we know that there are some on the endangered species list in the, in the Midwest. Um, but then there are others that are very common. The uh, next family is the Rio Dinidae. Now, these are the metal mark but butterflies, and they thrive in the tropical areas. So if you're traveling south in the summer, you'll more likely to run into these types of butterflies. And they have a lot of uh, markings there, as you can see from this example. The next family is the Nymphalidae. Now these are the brush-footed butterflies. So you'll see the fritillaries, the admirals, the emeralds, and the tortoise shells. Now more species are in this family than any other family of butterflies. Now their front legs are reduced, so they're not able to use them for walking like the other families. And so our last family is the Hesperidae, and these are the skippers. And true to their name, they're gonna skip across the landscape. They're a very small butterfly and they flutter rather quickly and they move from flower to flower um, and often in the grass as well. So the life cycle of Lepidoptera is pretty much the same across all of the species. The female will lay an egg or a series of eggs, uh, usually on the underside of a leaf. Uh, the egg will develop into a larva or a caterpillar. And the size and shape and color of the caterpillars will vary by species. So to protect themselves, caterpillars have developed a wide range of strategies. Uh, some of them change their pigmentation to match the color of their host plant. And if you're a gardener, 
you know this from the cabbage loafer uh, or the cabbage white uh, because their caterpillar is the same green as the cabbage or the broccoli or the cauliflower that we're trying to grow in our gardens and it makes them a challenge to spot. Um, other caterpillars will uh, develop spines or hairs and that makes them less appealing to birds or other predators. Um, and then other caterpillars will dine on very specific plants, which will make them uh, unpalatable to birds and serve as a warning so that birds will not try and eat another. Um, other strategies include feeding at night or on the undersides of leaves uh, so that um, they can do that under shelter as well. So caterpillars will molt uh, four or five times during their development. Um, during this period of time, but when they're changing that ectoskeleton, uh, they're not going to eat for that entire day. Um, and then they'll change, they'll molt, they'll develop a new ectoskeleton, and then they'll continue on with their development. Now their final molt is into the chrysalis form. And uh, this is also called the pupil stage. And so during this time uh, is where that true metamorphosis comes about. The uh, cells of the caterpillar break down into this viscous substance. And then these activated cells will develop into the head, the thorax, the abdomen, and the wings of the butterfly. And this will take about a week to two weeks uh, for this to occur. But even during this period of time, um, the chrysalis has some protective qualities because if it gets disturbed or tapped, um, the chrysalis will gyrate and um, move kind of violently so as to ward off any predator. And so once this development is complete, the butterfly will emerge, and this is usually in the morning, and that way they can take advantage of the warmth of the day to complete their development. So although the life cycles of butterflies are pretty consistent among species, the overwintering of butterflies is different uh, for different species. So some like the monarch will migrate, over, will migrate and overwinter in warmer climates. Um, others may enter a diapause where the metabolic activity is reduced and development is halted until conditions improve. And still others will hibernate. And so they're going to slow down their metabolic rate until environmental conditions improve. And this hibernation can be in leaf litter, it can be in the crevices of trees and the bark of trees. They may even shelter in secluded spaces uh, within the built environment as well. So next we're gonna talk about the components of a butterfly garden. So the first thing to be aware of is that uh, butterflies like us need shelter. And so the shelter will come in a variety of forms. Uh, you can see from this diagram, this graphic from the Xerxes Society, uh, some of those examples of shelter in our yards. So it comes in the form of trees, the leaf piles, or even the, uh, the stick piles that we might have in the back corner. Rocks, of course, make a great place for shelter, as well as that warming space. Um, and even those small built elements uh, within our garden, as well as the taller brush or grasses uh, or the stems that we leave in our winter garden. So the next component is sun. So butterflies need sun and sunny places to warm their bodies, not just when they emerge from the chrysalis, but during their adult life stages. Since they're not able to raise their internal temperature, they need the radiant heat from the sun and rocks or a sand patch uh, in order to warm themselves. So you'll notice that um, butterflies are not out on cool, wet days, like what we're experiencing today. We're just at 60 some odd degrees in June and a little bit of rain today. But maybe later as things warm up and the sun comes out, we will see those butterflies emerge but you'll notice them first on a warm sunny spot so that they can uh, generate some heat. 
And butterflies also need mud. Um, this is where they obtain micronutrients as well as water. And so this activity is called puddling and it can attract quite a nice sized group of butterflies. Um, you can see on the inset photo here that uh, the proboscis of the butterfly is collecting water, but then also salts. And so this is where they're getting those micronutrients. So you can create the, a little puddle quite easily in your garden by just clearing a space, maybe adding some salt, not salt, sand, <laughs> because they want the salt, but then also some rocks so that they can rest on the rocks or get their proboscis underneath for any uh, little crevices, things of that nature for moisture that might be there. Um, and so this can attract a good number of butterflies uh, rather quickly to your garden. And so the next component is food. Um, butterflies need plants for a couple of purposes. Um, one is food for their larva or their caterpillar. And these plants would be considered host plants. And um, butterflies are, will lay their eggs on or near the host plant for their caterpillars uh, so that they can have a good supply of food when needed. The second source of food for adults is for the nectar. And these plants provide the right combination of sugar in their nectar to attract pollinators. And it's at this point that butterflies are transferring pollen from one plant to the next. Um, as I mentioned earlier, butterflies are secondary pollinators, but they're still providing that pollination function because of the rough texture of their bodies and their wings they're collecting pollen and then transferring it to the next flower that they visit. So different species of butterflies prefer different flowers for their food source. In general, they prefer plants that provide a place to land. Um, the Asclepsias and Liatris that are seen here are really good examples as they have sufficient areas for butterflies to land and move about from flower to flower. Now, earlier when I was describing the families, um, was I talked about or noted that the butterflies have three sets of walking legs. And so they're using these legs to move gingerly uh, along the flowers and so that they can get uh, nectar as they need and move from flower to flower. Um, so that's part of the reason for having a certain type of flower so they can cling to it, they can slowly move about the flower and walk on the flower using their legs. Um, the depth of the flower's corolla is equally important um, as butterfly mouth parts uh, must be able to access nectar. So composite flowers like asters and sunflowers are often a favorite as they have shallow corollas and a large landing area. Um, and there are also three other considerations to keep in mind. Uh, first is to plant flowers in large blocks of color so that there's enough food for the visiting butterflies. The second is to have a diversity of plant species. That way you can support a diversity of butterfly species. And the third is to plant for continuous blooms so that they are supporting a variety of butterflies during each of their life stages. So next we're gonna talk about um, the butterflies that are represented, the butterfly families that are represented in Genesee County. I, collected this information from uh, the Butterflies and Moths of North America. Their website is uh, very helpful. It was started by the uh, USGS to collect this data and has continued to collect the data from citizen scientists and is verified by uh, those experts there and locally. And so uh, citizen scientists and scientists have contributed to this website in the various counties across uh, the United States and into North, into Canada. And um, as you go to visit, you can log in to the state and then the county, and you can find a checklist of species that have been identified 
um, in your county. And then you have this wonderful guide whenever you go out either into your garden or into, uh, into the wilds to look for butterflies. So then you can kind of check off your list of species. So it's from here that I gathered the information on the families that are present here in Genesee County. So I'm looking at a couple of species or a couple for each family. And we're gonna talk about uh, like their nectar plants and the host plants that they need. So this first family is the Nymphalaceae. Um, right here, we're looking at a white admiral. And what's nice about the Nymphalaceae is that um, they, um, they're, I apologize. <laughs> this is the brush-footed butterfly. And so their front legs are reduced and they're not uh, used for walking like the other butterflies. Um, the adults of some of these groups are the longest lived butterflies and some are surviving six to 11 months. Um, their feeding behaviors do vary by species and they're not limited to nectar. And so you can see here for the white admiral that they like nectar from the spirea and the viburnum, but they're also going to go to trees, uh, especially if there's an injury or there's sap flowing, and they're gonna collect nectar from the sap flows. They also like the rotting fruit and even the honeydew from aphids. So uh, they're collecting nutrients from a variety of sources. But you look at the host plants and these are trees or these woody aspects of our gardens. So we're looking at wild cherries, the populous species, so cottonwoods and aspens, our favorite, the oaks, um, as well as birches, and then the service berries. And then the second flower, the second butterfly <laughs> of this family is the monarch. And you can see that they really do enjoy nectarine from a variety of different plants. So we have our Asclepsius, our Lantana, the Liatris, as well as the Bidens that are their favorites for nectar. But they're also going to be very specific about where they lay their eggs. And so they're going to choose the Asclepsius as their host plant for their caterpillars. And um, we can go with a variety of different Asclepsius, uh, which is nice because each of these has unique traits that we would like or may not want to have in our garden. Um, my preference is the swamp milkweed. Um, so that one is, is nice in my garden. So our next family is the Lysinadea, and these are the gossamer wing butterflies. And so the adults of these species are typically small and often brilliantly colored. Um, not all species visit flowers for nectar, but most do. And uh, these species are reliant upon ants to protect uh, their caterpillars because their caterpillars are slug shaped. Um, so uh, they're not as dynamic as other caterpillars and they do rely upon the ants to help um, provide some services there. Um, most species either overwinter in the egg or the pupil stage of their development. And here we have the Eastern blue. And so you can see that it too is a very dynamic butterfly. When it rests and has its wings open, you have that brilliant blue, but when the wings are closed, um, it's this off white or silver on the, on the back sides of their wings. And they like a number of short tubed flowers as their source for nectar. But as you see for their host plants, they're looking at um, things that you might find in, um, in your garden or even in your lawn. Uh, so those uh, members of the legume family or the Fabiaceae's um, is where they're going to uh, lay their eggs for their caterpillars. So the next butterfly we're gonna look at is the Acadian hair street. So you see that uh, they too like the, the milkweeds and the spirea as well as other flowers that have short tubes, short corollas. 
uh, but their host plants are going to be the woody stemmed uh, willows. And so somewhat specifics because they are in the Salix family, but uh, a little bit of difference there in the type of, of willow that they're looking for for their eggs. So our next family is the Papilinia Dei family or Papilion Dei family. That one's a tongue twister. Um, here, these uh, swallowtails um, enjoy milkweeds and thistles, as well as rhododendron and lantana. So they do choose a variety of different plants as nectar plants. But their host plants, they are looking for some woody material. So their spice bush, the sassafras, even the tulip tree and sweet bay magnolia. And then the giant swallowtail uh, is very similar to the previous one that we saw, um, except for their host plants, they actually like the prickly ash and the hop tree. And so we know that we've got a number of ash trees here in the region, so we often see the giant swallowtail. So our next species or family to look at is the Pyridae, and these are the sulfurs and the whites. And so the majority of whites and sulfurs feed on legumes and crucifers. So that is the peas and the coal crops. Uh, the females lay eggs on the leaves, on the buds, on the stems, almost every part of these plants except for the roots. And they lay their eggs in a columnar form. Um, typically they overwinter in the pupal or the larval stage, particularly in our temperate climate. Um, you'll see here, this is the clouded sulfur, and they like uh, the milkweed and the goldenrod and the asters. Again, these short corolla flowers, but their host plants for their uh, eggs and caterpillars are going to be in the Fabiaceae family. Uh, so those peas and uh, clovers. And then the orange sulfur, again, they share the same uh, favorite for nectar plants and for host plants for uh, their eggs and larvae. So we're gonna see the Fabiaceae and the clovers as well. Let's see, there we go. And so the next family is the Hesperidae. And these are the skippers. And so again, they're small species with a very stout body. They actually have fairly large eyes and their antenna are kind of short. Um, the antenna for them is kind of unique. It's more clubbed at the end and it has a small little hook. Um, their flight is often very rapid and they feed on the nectar of plants, but they also utilize bird droppings as a nutritional source. And so the wild indigo dusky wing uh, feeds on a variety of nectar plants but it has a very specific host plant as its name suggests. It likes the wild indigo, but then also the lupins and the false lupin uh, for its eggs and uh, caterpillar. And then the next uh, butterfly in this family is the tawny edge skipper. And it enjoys the thistle and the dog bane as well as the cone flowers for its nectar. But when it's laying its eggs, it's looking for grasses instead of flowers or woody plants. Um, so that's a very uh, unique aspect to this butterfly. So we're looking at different grasses uh, to add to our garden in order to support uh, this little jewel. So when it comes to maintenance of our gardens, we need to keep in mind uh, the butterfly species that are visiting our garden. Uh, it's always nice to have that list of, from our observations and then do our own research to really get to know what the life cycle is of these butterflies. And then we need to cull or prune our garden based on this life cycle. One of the things to consider is how many um, broods will these butterflies have in a year? And if it's only going to be one, then that makes our uh, maintenance schedule a lot easier. But if there's more than one species in your garden or um, multiple broods per year, then we need to pay special attention. So things to consider is to trim minimally 
we always like to have a nice neat garden, but maybe you just trim a little so that it looks clean and tidy. And then instead of composting those uh, clippings right away, put them into a brush pile. Uh, that way, if there are any eggs that are on this brush, then they can continue to develop. And then those caterpillars might have an opportunity to find their host plant. Whenever we were listening to a Doug Talame presentation, he noted that the eggs may be laid close to the host plant. And that's also a means of protection for the egg so that whenever the caterpillar emerges, it has a short distance to travel to the plant that it will use as its food source. So that uh, is a nice protective cycle that is used to cut down on predation. So maybe consider when we're maintaining our garden beds that if we do some trimming, what if we just lay those trimmings down close to our plant, uh, the flowering plant? That way things are clean and tidy, but close to that host plant for the caterpillars. It's always good to control weeds from encroaching in the garden. And uh, most importantly, let's forego the pesticide use in the garden, not only for our butterflies, but for our bees and for ourselves. So next we have a few additional species that I wanted to, to draw attention to. Um, some of these I have in my garden and enjoy a lot. Um, the first one is the uh, native coneflower, the green-headed coneflower. Um, this one gets rather tall. It has a beautiful foliage, those nice deep uh, lanceated leaves. The lobes are nice and deep um, and it supports the silvery checker spot. The native thistles are nice as well. And so we showed two here, the swamp and the yellow thistle. And these are not to be confused with the Canadian or the bull thistle, which can be bullies in our garden. These uh, are able, we're able to control a little bit more and they do have that unique foliage and blossom that are very attractive to painted lady butterflies. And then there are violets. These are the first flowers of spring in my garden. And I love that my backyard is full of these violets. And I make sure that I keep a patch that um, is not mowed for a very long time. And I allow them to be ground cover in my garden beds so that I know that I'm supporting the butterflies as well as um, some of the first bees of spring. I was the the nectar source as well as the host plant for caterpillars. And we can see here that it supports a number of fritillaries, uh, which is really nice to see. And then here are our native grasses. Uh, these can serve as uh, structural elements within our garden. The big blue stem is, is wonderful because you have those beautiful blue colors and then this nice shaggy head of, of seeds at the top. The little blue stem is equally dynamic as well as switchgrass. And then the bottle brush, um, the seed head for this one just makes you smile uh, because it's so dynamic as well. And you can see here, it supports the common wood nymph as well as a variety of skippers that are prevalent here in our area. And then there's some native shrubs that we want to consider as well for structure in our gardens. Uh, the New Jersey tea, the spice bush, and even the pussy willow is nice. And we are supporting the summer azure, the Arcadian hair streak, as well as a number of swallowtails uh, by having these plants in our garden. And then we've got native trees as well that offer support. Um, the dogwoods, the oaks, and the choke cherries are going to provide those first flowers of spring for those uh, insects that are looking for nectar sources early in the year. And those would be the spring azure, the banded hair streak and the coral hair streak. And so I found a number of my sources from um, the Xerxes Society, as well as Butterflies and Moths of North America. And then there are a few wonderful books that I use as resources, uh, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Talame as well as The Butterfly Garden by Matthew Tukulski. And then more recent publications from Heather Holm, Pollinators of Native Plants. She has done great research and provides uh, 
a very good graphically illustrated book that's helpful for us in our gardens. And then a, uh, another gardener, Kim Ironman, and she created the Pollinator Victory Garden, which has a lot of good information on butterflies as well as bees and doing the gardening for them. And so I think that kind of concludes my presentation and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Thanks Leslie. Leslie, this was awesome. So folks, if you've got a small group, you can either put your question in the chat and Leslie can answer it, or you can unmute and you can ask it uh, live. So do we have any questions for Leslie? Actually, I think butterflies have got to be one of the most fascinating insects because that time that they're in the chrysalis, they're physically doing they almost go like to mush and come out as a butterfly <laughs> i know i know it's the true metamorphosis that to occurs me, that's that's one of the most interesting things about them yeah yeah um, okay, okay so, so susan you mentioned using native violets as ground cover i do um i was blessed whenever we bought the house that there were a number of violets um in the backyard and um, I purposefully make sure that I do not uh, mow them, um, at least until after all the blooms have ended. But um, I'll make sure that I have some of the violets in certain locations so that they're used as that ground cover because they are such a nice low plant. Um, and they stay, stay green all year, well, through the growing season. And um, they just are very... Um, durable within the garden and that's nice yeah and i also use um the violets as ground cover especially in shade mm -hmm. and they are a fantastic little ground cover i just think and i have different sizes i yeah. also introduced a labrador violet which has a darker uh -huh. leaf so i love violets so mm -hmm. i even let them go in my lawn um, <laughs> Her dandelions are not as supportive of bees or butterflies. Would the violets be better? I kind of think, um, in my opinion, they are, but I haven't read anything specifically. I think it's primarily because of the color of the, the violet that, that is more attractive to, um, to the insects that, you, that have ultraviolet vision. Um, they are able to provide that nectary for them as well. And um, they're coming out a little bit earlier than the dandelion. Yeah, but I think, well, and violets are a host plant also, as you said. I know dandelion, yes. there know has dandelions. been some there has been some discussion, we'll say, discussion, as to, we'll say as to, you know, is their pollen or nectar is beneficial as some of our native plants. But I'm also thinking that in May, when dandelions are abundant, yeah, you might not have other things in your garden in such abundance. And I'm just doing a little experiment in my own yard this year. Uh -huh. Leslie shot me a couple photos too of things that were using dandelions. And it was everything from ants to bees to mm -hmm. other insects. So um yeah, yeah my neighbors probably, probably don't like me but i don't mow my dad <laughs> <laughs> i tried to wait since they're perennial i tried to um wait until the they start to create that poof ball and then i mow it and try and capture the seeds so that i'm not you know spreading right. it or at least have some you know the myth of having control over my dandelions yeah, but well, I'm so. I'm kind of out in the country, so. <laughs> so Karen has a difficult question. What do you do if your town tells you that you have to cut the grass you are growing for seed heads? So how can you handle nasty neighbors? Right. So what I suggest is that uh, you can certify your garden and then provide that sign. Uh, post the sign that's in your garden that says this is pollinator habitat. Another option is to, or in conjunction with that, is to have a maintenance edge so that you're showing that you are taking care by maintaining that edge, whether that's mowed or it has um, a, a brick edge of some sort. And then maybe just being selective in your cuttings so that uh, the form of your plant with its seed heads looks very purposeful. 
and intentional. Um, you can even put labels with your garden plants so that it's identified as something very specific. So all of these things provide clues and cues to your neighbors and to city officials if you have to defend your, your garden style. Um, then you can provide that information to them. So you're being an educated gardener and you're also educating your neighbors and your municipality on your gardening choices. But I think probably one of the best and easiest things to do is to certify your garden and go ahead and post that sign that says, this is protecting pollinator habitat. And I, I think some of the towns zoning and especially in a city or a more urban area, um, we're getting there, but we're not all quite there yet that this is something going on. I know some states, I don't know if it's New Jersey, have actually passed legislature for those who have certified habitat. New York's not there yet. And sometimes I think you actually have to become more involved at the zoning level and even get on your town um, zoning boards or educate your zoning folks. Mm -hmm. And we still have a very much um, perception of the perfect lawn as being, you know, short. Um, we're not, we have this uh, perception that we need to change. We've been I'm working on this for a while now, but a lot of people are still very much, you know, the perfect lawn is short. It's, everything's got to be neat and tidy. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of things that go around on Facebook as to the no mow may and yeah. um, things like that. So Karen, I think we're heading in the right direction, but not, not everybody's on board yet. So that is a very difficult um, thing to do. But like Leslie said, some of the recommendations are is to make it look like you're intentionally creating a space with those mown edges. Um, honestly, in my yard, my very front yard, I do try to keep it mown shorter. And then I have a definite mulch border and then the actual garden. So in the back, I kind of, you know, do what I want. But in the front where the neighbors are walking by or looking, I, I do try to keep that section of lawn shorter. And I planted things like the birds of tree foil that I know will bloom when it's mown. So those are some of my other things you can do. Other questions for, for Leslie? We'll give everybody a minute. Um, and I know the fun thing is fascinating too, because I've found Butterflies out in the wild at puddles wild and when they're puddling. Puddles. So I think uh -huh. that's that's an interesting that's aspect. An interesting and the fact aspect. that they don't all want flowers. All want Some flowers. of them want bird, bird droppings and, and fermenting yeah. fruit, fermenting let's say. Fruit, let's say. <laughs> so, so yeah, I don't yeah, know if your neighbors want <laughs> that <laughs> out. But the bird <laughs> droppings, I think, are pretty, pretty much provided by nature. But right, right. I have seen the butterfly feeders where you can put like a banana or something out. It's, it's never worked for me. Yeah, I've never yeah. had good luck. No, likewise, likewise. Yeah, but, but I have seen morning cloaks in the spring go to a tree that had sap running. Ah, uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, the puddlers, the puddling is is very interesting too, especially when it's a, a wet, sunny space. Right. Because you're getting both both activities right there. Right. Um, and in the research for the presentation. Um, it was noted that you'll find more males than females at the puddles. Yeah. And, um, you know, is it an all boys club? Who knows? Or discussing different ways. So I'm going to fly like this or I'm yeah, going to exactly. stake out over here. <laughs> now, insects are really quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so any, I don't see any more questions. So, so I think we'll end it today. today. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, Thank you all for joining us today. today. We, we are recording this, so we will be posting it if you want to go back and um, catch some of Leslie's information. And you know what? I will ask Leslie to send me the reference page. And then um, when I get this up to the YouTube, I will send everybody out her references. But the Xerces Society, if you're interested in butterflies, pollinators, beneficial insects, that is a wonderful resource for us to use. Mm -hmm. So thanks again, Leslie, and thank you everybody for joining us. 
We're going to be taking a little break from our garden talks and we'll be back on August 5th for a related topic of beneficial insects. So everything's up on our website for registrations. We're going to continue on Zoom for a while. And um, I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Nice presentation. Enjoyed it.